Well, welcome everyone to our Wednesday afternoon Bible study, or evening, or tomorrow, or whenever you happen to see it. Just uh, looking forward to sharing a little bit more from God's Word in Ezra, chapter 5, verse 7. Uh, first of all, I'd like to make mention that the governor has issued a statewide mask ordinance. And uh, what that means for us is that we have always encouraged you to wear a mask. Some of you can't, we get that. We know that. Some can't, and that's fine. But as much as possible, when we come to church on Sundays, we need to wear our masks, and use the hand sanitizer. And, uh, I don't want to see us go backwards and have to shut down again. I, I would not be happy if that happened, so, and neither would you. So, uh, well, hopefully we can avoid that by uh, doing the statewide mask thing. Uh, I have my beverage with me. I'm enjoying a Diet Coke today. I won't be drinking it while we're talking, but... Uh, you enjoy yours, and we'll go forward. In Ezra, chapter, starting with Ezra chapter 5, we're going to cover a little bit of ground we did last week, and then we'll go on to uh, all the way through chapter 7, or not through, but partway into chapter 7. I've entitled this, God is in Control. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for today, this beautiful day that you've given us. Not too hot, not too cold, just about right. What a wonderful day. And it's a good day to study your word, and learn from the book of Ezra uh, about uh, how you rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. So thank you, Lord, and we praise you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Open our hearts and minds to understand your work, we pray in your name. Last week, we looked at Ezra and the enemies of Judah, who are, who are the governors of the outlying provinces, are doing our level best to stop the building and rebuilding all the walls of the temple and essentially trying to stop Judah from becoming a nation again. We saw in Zechariah chapter 3 that Satan was standing there to accuse uh, Zach, uh, Joshua from offering sacrifices and accepting the nation back again. So uh, in this instance now I kind of have a funny little illustration. Have you ever had a sister or a brother say to you, I'm telling mom what you said or I'm telling mom what you did. Essentially, that's what they were saying to the builders in Jerusalem in the temple. If you don't stop what you're doing, we're going to tell King Artaxerxes on you. And they did. They wrote a letter to him suppose, uh, outlining the past history of the rebellion uh, that the Jews did against Assyrians, against the Babylonians, and now supposedly they're rebelling against the Persian kingdom. This letter motivated King Artaxerxes to issue a decree saying, telling them to stop the rebuilding of the temple right away, stop right now. We have to understand that the book of Nehemiah is concerned about the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. But Ezra is concerned about rebuilding the temple. The book of Ezra is concerned about rebuilding the temple and the time frame from the end of chapter 5 to the beginning of chapter 6 is approximately 14 years. So the rebuilding efforts stopped for 14 years. They didn't restart the building program again until the prophets Haggai and Zechariah gave them a message from the Lord. He was very displeased that the building project had stopped. God had sent them back to rebuild the temple, rebuild the walls, rebuild the city, but they had stopped because of their enemies. And Haggai, chapter 1, verse 4, Is it time for you to run to your paneled houses while well, this house lies desolate? They were sacrificing to the Lord in the ruins of the temple. And when we were in Israel last fall, we saw lots of ruins. As a matter of fact, that's mostly what we saw was ruins the first part of our trip. There's a lot of ruins. While you run to your panel houses, this house lies desolate. And they were sacrificing to the Lord in the ruins of the temple. God considered this unclean. He had blasted away their produce. He had blasted away any increase they could have had in their, in their animals, their livestock, and, and their monies, and their children. Any increase he had blasted away because he was displeased with them about their disobedience of, of this clearly spoken word. One thing we have to realize, God will not bless disobedience. 
Haggai 1, 7 and 8 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. So, consider what you're doing, he said. You're not being obedient to me. Therefore, I have taken away any increases you might have had. Go up to the mountains, bring back wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified in it, says the Lord of hosts. Haggai 1.12 Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord. In the words of Haggai the prophet, and the Lord their God, and knew that the Lord their God had sent him. So this brings us now to chapter 5, from Ezra's vantage point, verses 1 and 2. When the prophets of when the prophets Haggai and the prophet Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the Lord God of Israel, who were over them, and then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehoshadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So they listened to the prophets. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Now remember, years ago, years before that, before they went into exile, they weren't listening to the prophets. They didn't want to listen to them. But now they are listening to the voice of the prophets, which is the voice of the Lord. Haggai 1.13 And Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commissioner of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. It was the same message that he gave to Joshua when they started the conquest of the Promised Land centuries before. They had come from Egypt. They spent 40 years wandering in the desert because of disobedience. Now they're ready to cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land God had promised them. Moses was dead. Joshua was taken over as the leader of the people. And the Lord said to him, As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now we are on the, on the top of the mountain where Moses stood and looked across the Jordan River to the into the Promised Land. We were split up there and looked across the Jordan River, Jordan River Valley. We saw the Dead Sea. We saw the Sea of Galilee. All these places, and there was there's a beautiful park up there, where you can you can see the uh, plains of Megiddo on one side and the Jordan River on the other side, and it's just a beautiful spot, a beautiful park. And this is where Moses stood on the top of Mount Nebo to see what God, what he could not go physically see himself. God showed it all to him. Now Joshua is going to take over. No man will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Will life be easy for them? No. Following God isn't always easy. It's not always an easy thing to do, but it's always rewarding. But the Lord promised to see them through. He had seen them through the conquest. He had seen them through the exile. And he will also see, see them through the rebuilding process as a nation. The governors of the outlying provinces again rose up to stop them. In a letter they sent to King Darius, they reported this to him. They asked the elders, they had asked the elders and said to them, in, in, thus in verse 9, Who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and finish this structure? We also asked them their names so as to form you that we might write down the names of the men who were, were at their head. Thus they answered us, saying, We are the servants of God of heaven and of earth on rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which, which the great king of Israel built and finished. That great king was David's son, Solomon, who had built the first temple hundreds of years before. It was a magnificent structure. But because our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean who destroyed this temple and deported the people to Babylon. So here's the history. This is what had happened. But if we don't learn from our history, we're doomed to repeat it. If they had to learn from their history that their disobedience to the Word of God brought disaster. So now, they aren't working against human authority. But they're also working with a higher authority much higher than King Cyrus. 
King Cyrus had given him human authority to go ahead with the rebuilding, but they're also working with God's authority, the Lord God of heaven and earth. They're working under his authority, which is even more than King Darius. Then they offer more evidence that they were within their rights to do what they were supposed to do. Verse 14. Also the gold and silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from, that, from the temple in Jerusalem and brought them to the temple of Babylon, these King Cyrus took from the temple of Babylon, and they were given to one whose name was Sheshbazar, who had been appointed governor. So this man had been appointed governor. He was supposed to take these gold and silver temple furnishings to the, back to the temple, the new temple in Jerusalem, and put them in their place so they could be used for worship. God had done this to protect them so that they wouldn't be lost. They were brought there for safekeeping. Nebuchadnezzar thought they were spoils of war, but God saw them as protecting them for the future temple. Verse 15 and 16, he said to him, Take these utensils and go and deposit it in the temple in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt in this place. Then Sheshbazar came and laid the foundation of the temple of God in Jerusalem. And from then until now it has been under construction. It is not yet complete. Why? Because the enemies of God have stopped the construction. If you remember when Jesus, Jesus cleared the temple, how many times did he clear the temple? He cleared it twice. Early on in his ministry, he cleared the temple so, and so people could pray. And then when he came down from the Mount of Olives on Palm Sunday, in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he cleared the temple again. He overturned the tables and the money changers chased out the goats and released the birds and said, and, and chased people out. And he said, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Why did he say that? Well, they were charging exorbitant rates for, for money exchange. They would not accept Roman money into the temple treasure because it had Caesar's inscription on it. It had Caesar's face on it. So they, they would exchange the money into temple money so that they could get offerings into the temple. But there was an exorbitant exchange rate. They were also uh, taking advantage of people, bringing in sacrifices. Well, they declared a sacrifice was unfit for sacrifice. It was spotted or it had some defect or something. And so they would sell them a different animals for sacrifice at a much higher rate. So the Lord was angry. He was angry with them. And he's, you show not, you have made my my uh, my house a house of thieves. This was the only place the Gentiles could pray. They could not go into the te into the court of the Jews where they'd be stoned to death. So they had to pray in the court of the Gentiles. But it was a marketplace. You can imagine all the commotion that was going on there. Try to pray, pray to the Lord in a place where there was a lot of commotion. The governor asked King Darius, the governors then, asked King Darius, well, I'm going to finish that story. So when, when G the next day Jesus was teaching in the temple, and the Pharisees and the scribes came up to him and said, by whose authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? He had upset their whole apple cart. This was a lucrative business for the temple, and he had upset their whole apple cart. As you remember, Jesus asked them a question. He said, John the Baptist, was he from, sent from God or sent from men? And of course they refused to answer the question. And so he said, neither will I answer your question by whose authority I do these things. He was God in the flesh. He had authority over the temple. The governor is asking Darius that a search be made from the royal treasury, where the documents are kept to see if such a scroll could be found. And could King Darius please render a decision on this matter. Can they rebuild the temple or not? The intent, of course, was to stop the work once again. Whoever God is in control, it is he who is motivating, motivating the people to build the temple. But there's a lot more at stake at this. At stake is our salvation, because from the Jews would come our Savior, Jesus. So in Ezra chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, we read how King Darius responds to this letter. King Darius issued a decree, and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. 
Ecbatana in a fortress, which is in the province of Media, a scroll was found. And there was written in it as follows. I like this word, memorandum. We still use that word today, memorandum. Did you ever get the memo? Didn't you get the memo? Memorandum. In the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God in Jerusalem. Let the temple, the place of sacri where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt, and its foundations be retained, its height being sixty cubits, and its width sixty cubits, with three layers of huge stones, one layer of timbers, and one layer of timbers. Let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. In our time, we would call this wartime reparations. U.S. has paid out down through the last decade, the last century, billions of dollars to countries in wartime reparations that, that were destroyed by war to help them rebuild infrastructure and their economies. We have paid out billions of dollars for that. Well, 60 cubits, how much is that? Well, a cubit is considered the distance between your elbow and your tip. So it's considered to be 18 inches. Okay, 60 times 18 is 90 feet. So 90 foot wide and 90 foot tall. That's how big this structure was to be. Verse 5, And also the gold and silver utensils in the house of God which Nebuchadnezzar took from their temple in Jerusalem had brought them to Babylon to be returned and brought back to their places in the temple in Jerusalem. So all the worship utensils, it was in three different installments that these utensils were brought back as, as uh, refugees were returning back to their homeland again and back to Jerusalem. They would bring more, uh, they would bring more of these utensils back with them, the soul, the gold, and the silver. So, King Darius instructs them not to hinder them. So Tatanai and the governor of the province beyond the river, Shezdar Bozanai and your colleagues, the officials of the province beyond the river, keep away from there, lest the work leave the work on this house of God alone. In other words, stop bothering them. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, he said this, I issue a decree concerning what you are to do for these elders of Judah in the rebuilding of the house of God. The full cost to be paid to these people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of the provinces beyond the river. So the monies were going to come from the provinces of those governors were opposing the work. God has a real good sense of humor, I think. And that without delay, he says, whatever is needed, both young bulls, rams, and lambs for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and anointing oil, as the priests in Jerusalem request, is to be given to them without fail, that they may offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. So he understood the power of prayer. As we do here in this church, we understand the power of prayer. And we know that God answers our prayers. So the king wanted prayer for him and his sons. That's a, that's a good request. So if they failed to do what they were to do, King, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king Darius said, I issued a decree in verse 11. I issue a decree that any man who violates his edict, a timber shall be drawn from the from his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a refuse heap on account of this. Whoa. That's a pretty good incentive not to oppose to what Darius has said. Well, what do we know about Darius? Just a little bit more. I'm almost done with our study. Was King Darius who had to throw Daniel to the lions. And he had, it was King Darius who saw it was God who had rescued him. I believe Darius understood and knew the real God, at least a little bit. Maybe he didn't worship him, I don't know. But at least he believed in him. At least he knew the power of this God. And all this that we can learn, God is in control. 
you know, we have this coronavirus thing going on. It's been a real thorn in our sides, and, and the violence that's been going on in our country, that's been a real problem for people. But God is in control. He is on our side, and He is busy working for us. Yeah, it's difficult to see sometimes. We can't always see it. But God loves us, cares for us, and He's in control. Well, that's my study for today. Um, let's pray in closing, and then we'll, uh, we'll look forward to Sunday. I hope to see you here in church. God bless you, and have a great rest of the week. Father, we thank you for your word to us, the lessons we can learn. We thank you for the study in Ezra, in Nehemiah. Bless that word to our, to our hearts and minds, Lord, and may we gain encouragement as we see you work on behalf of your people. And now we are your people too, Lord, and we want to see you work on behalf of us. We know you do, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, have a great week. We'll see you on Sunday in church. God bless you. Thank mm -hmm. you.